Cupcakes! Welcome to another video. So in today's video, we will be discussing about the antibiotics and the mechanism of action of some of the very commonly used antibiotics. So now you are all aware that most of these exams definitely do ask questions on antibiotics and their mode of action. So stay tuned till the end of the video to know more about these. So now, without much further ado, let's get right into this video. So in the first slide, I have generalized certain classes of antibiotics and I have given the general mode of action. Further on, we will be discussing specific antibiotics. So firstly, let me tell you that there are majorly five classes of antibiotics. That is the aminoglycosides, macrolides, beta-lactams, quinolones, and sulfur drugs. So aminoglycosides basically include the antibiotics like gentamicin, carnamicin, tobramycin, streptomycin, and amikacin. And most of you would be aware that aminoglycosides inhibit the protein synthesis. Next, we have macrolides. Basically, macrolides are antifungals. They bind to the ergosterol present in the fungal cell membrane. Examples are amphotericin B and neastatin. Next, we have beta-lactams, a very common class of antibiotics. So these are basically antibacterials that act on the cell walls of bacteria. Examples include penicillin, cephalosporins, amoxicillin. Next, we have quinolones. So quinolones are inhibitors of the subunit of DNA gyrase. These induce relaxation. Examples are nalidixic acid and ciprofloxacin. Next, we have sulfur drugs. They inhibit the synthesis of folic acid. Examples include trimethoprim and prontosin. Okay. Now let's move on to specific antibiotics and their modes of action. So first up in the list is erythromycin. So erythromycin basically binds to the smaller subunit of the 50S ribosome, that is 23S rRNA, and it blocks the exit of the peptide chain. So the peptide chain is no longer be able to exit from the E site. Okay, This antibiotic is obtained from streptomyces. Okay. Next, we have chloramphenicol. Again, chloramphenicol acts by inhibiting the protein synthesis. Specifically, it prevents the elongation of the peptide by inhibiting the peptidyl transferase activity. It binds to the 23S rRNA subunit, okay, and it prevents the formation of the peptide bond. The organism from which chloramphenicol is isolated is Streptomyces venezuelae. So this is a diagrammatic representation to show you how chloramphenicol works. So basically, you need this peptidyl transferase to attach the amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. So when you have chloramphenicol, this particular activity of this peptidyl transferase is blocked and therefore the polypeptide chain cannot be synthesized. Next, we have puromycin, which prevents the translation by inhibiting peptidyl transferase. Next, we have rifampicin, a very commonly used drug. Rifampicin basically inhibits the bacterial RNA polymerase, which is responsible for the transcription process. So as you can see, it blocks this portion in this DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So no longer elongation of the mRNA can be done. Next in the list is Fluoroquinones. Now, what do fluoroquinones do? They are basically inhibitors of the DNA synthesis. They actually stabilize the double-stranded breaks created by gyrase and topomerase, topoisomerase 4. So let us try and understand how that works. So you have DNA polymerase that keeps on replicating DNA. What quinolones do is they bind to the topoisomerase, which actually relaxes the DNA and then stop the process of unwinding and therefore no more DNA can be replicated. It also is known to stabilize the double-stranded breaks. Now, if there are double-stranded breaks, the cell cycle will not be able to progress, ultimately leading to cell death. Next, we have nalidixic acid. It is an inhibitor of the subunit A of the bacterial DNA gyrase. 
Next, we have novobiosin, again an inhibitor of gyrase, and it induces formation of a relaxation complex analog. Then we have cyclohexamine, which binds to the ribosome and specifically inhibits the elongation factor EF2, okay, in the protein synthesis step. So it inhibits the translation elongation. Next, we have tunicamycin, which inhibits N-linked glycosylation by preventing core oligosaccharide addition to the polypeptide chain. So what it essentially does is it prevents the glycosylation and therefore improper folding occurs and the exit from the ER cannot be done. Next is alpha aminitin. It is an inhibitor of RNA polymerase 2 and 3. Mind you, alpha aminitin is a very commonly used antibiotic to differentiate between the polymerases. So like polymerase 1 is not affected by alpha aminitin, polymerase 2 and 3 are affected, okay, out of which one of them has a higher sensitivity. Next, we have Prontosil, which is actually the first synthetic drug that was used for bacterial infections. But uh, now it's no more use because when it reaches to the tissue, it gets disrupted and becomes inactive. So nowadays we use beta-lactams in place of prontosin. Next, the sulfonamides or the sulfa drugs. So basically the sulfonamides or the sulfa drugs, they inhibit the synthesis of folic acid. How? They prevent the addition of paraminobenzoic acid to folic acid. So the enzyme that carries out this conversion is the enzyme dihydropteric synthase, which is basically inhibited by these sulfonamides. Okay, so this addition doesn't take place and ultimately the cycle is blocked. Okay, lastly, we have gentamicin. Gentamicin should have come in the initial antibiotics where we were discussing those antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis. So gentamicin, like the other antibiotics we discussed initially, prevent the protein synthesis, these bind to the 30S subunit of the bacterial ribosome. So that's it from me for today. Hopefully this video was helpful. Please like, share and subscribe and do let me know what videos you want me to make next. That's it from me for today. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.